All right. Well, I have, let's see. I don't want to do that. Good afternoon, everybody. It is now one o'clock and I am live streaming to you. Um, I had an interesting time this morning with the Zoom um, meetings. Quite interesting um, to meet with that many people. And what I found is it would be really cool if I had a mute button like that at school. Wouldn't that be awesome? I know some of you would totally love it. And some of you would totally be <laughs> uh, in shock and not know what to do. Hi, Evan. I see you're the first person in the chat. Good job. Way to go. Um, so today, um, let's see, I've got four people here so far waiting for some more people. Oh, there's Owen. Hi, Owen. I always want to call you Allison. From now on, I'm going to call you Allison. No, I'm just kidding. I won't. I promise. Um, so anyway, um, I'm just waiting for a few more people. There's five people on now. And it's really weird. I wish I could see who those five people were. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, my mom might even be watching. <laughs> I better behave. Um, I have my glasses on because I'm going to be reading. And since I've been home, I've needed them more and more. Oh, hi, Owen, Zilka. How are you? Um, yeah, so I'm just waiting for a few more people um, to get on live. I've got a different emails and texts from people saying that they were going to log on. So I just wanted to wait a minute. Um, I think... I, okay, so while we're waiting for a few more people, possibly, I got to read some jokes to you. I know you love jokes. Um, let's see. Uh, these are not good. Okay, let me see. Oh, I got one. It's a knock-knock joke. You guys ready? Okay. You're going to have to reply in the comments section. Hi, Grayson. Knock-knock. Um, knock. Someone has to say it in the comment section, you know, who's there waiting. I'm looking down, I'm looking down at the comments. So if that looks funny, I don't, oh, there we go, Grayson. Good job, Evan. Okay. Um, Barry. You know what the next response is? Hi, Ella. Come on, Grayson, you're faster than that. You're supposed to say, Barry who? There you go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Just on cue. Okay. Barry, nice to see you again. That's such a dad joke. These are like the, the funniest jokes. Okay. So, well, they're not really funny. I didn't mean they were funny. I meant like funny, not funny. Um, let's see. I don't know. What do you call a dog who talks a lot? Hi, Lila. What do you call a dog who talks a lot? Sorry, I'm trying to get my my computer steady there. Any guesses? What do you call a dog who talks a lot? I'll wait for your responses. <laughs> Grayson's like, what? Oh, you were like, what? Because you don't know. Got it. Talking dog. Uh, that was a pretty good guess, Grayson. Um, you call it a blabador. Ha, ah, funny blabador. Get it? Ha, ha, blab. Okay, it wasn't really that funny. All right, let's see. Hi, Aiden. Okay. Um, any, okay, uh. How did the, okay, here's another one. Are you ready? Okay. How did the flashlight feel when its batteries died? <laughs> Grayson, you're killing me, cracking me up. 
Any guesses? How did the bat? How did the flashlight feel when the, its batteries died? <laughs> Evan dead. Um, no, it was <laughs> it was delighted. Get it? Lighted? D de delighted? I know. These are good though. Cracking me up because they're so bad. All right. I think. Okay, you guys ready for me to read something? <laughs> I'm cracking myself up. Okay. Um, let's see. How about I read... I would be sad if I did one. <laughs> well, I would be too, um, Evan. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to read... That's one mental flash. Oh, that's funny. Um, I am going to start reading this at some point today. You guys want me to read The Boy in the Wooden Box? I love reading your comments, by the way. I'm here finally. All right, people. So um, we're up to 17 followers, but... I'm going to start. <laughs> Evan's not sure. Sure. Um, so this is the book that I was supposed to read to you right about now because we would have been finished with our essay writing. And so um, this book is based on a true story. And usually I do a whole bunch of information, like you get to watch short videos and things like that, read some things about World War II. And he, nobody put him in a box, Evan. Um, it's on the wooden box. See, on, O-N. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, this is based on a true story. Um, and it is about the youngest survivor on Schindler's list. So Schindler, Oscar Schindler, a little bit of background history for you guys, not that you care, but you should. Um, Oscar Schindler was um, a Nazi and he owned a factory. And through all of the things that happened to the Jewish people, he um, saved thousands of lives, thousands of Jewish lives. And you're going to learn how he saved the life of the author. Um, well, it's a memoir. Um, he didn't actually write it, but um, Leon Layson. So this is his memories of what it was like during World War II to be a, a Jewish boy that is your age. All right. So some of the comments on the side, um, please um, keep them. Not that they're not appropriate, but this is definitely a book that it's not funny and it's probably not anything to be joking about. Um because it's pretty serious and it's, it's true. The good news, not to spoil it, but the good news is that obviously he survives the Holocaust because he's here. He helped write this book. So that's the good news. So um, through all of this, just remember he does survive, um, but it is the Holocaust. And there are people in this book that do die and it's pretty, um, it gives a lot of detail about what it was like to be in the concentration camps and also just to be Jewish living at that time. So um, I'm going to start reading it. Um, I hope that you like it. You know how sometimes beginnings of books, I'm just going to ask, give it a chance. You might not really, really like it right away, but um, it's just kind of the beginning setting the stage for what happens later in the book. So it's kind of important to get through that. So, you know, it's called background information. So then you know once um, this starts. Good. Okay. Are you guys ready? I'm going to start. All right. So again, this is um, the boy on the wooden box. And on the front, it says, How the Impossible Became Possible on Schindler's List. And it's a memoir by Leon Lason with Marilyn Heron and Elizabeth Lason. So... Um, here we go. The prologue part. 
I have to admit, my palms were sweaty and my stomach was churning. I had been waiting in line patiently, but that didn't mean I wasn't nervous. It was my, my turn next to shake the hand of the man who had saved my life many times. But that was years ago. Now I wondered if he would even recognize me. Earlier that day in autumn 1965, on my way to the Los Angeles airport, I told myself that the man I was about to meet might not remember me. It had been two decades since I had seen him, and that meeting had been on another continent and under vastly different circumstances. I had been a scrawny, starving boy of 15 who was the size of a 10-year-old. Now that I was a grown man of 35, I was married, a U.S. citizen, and an Army veteran, and a teacher. As others move forward to greet our guest, I stay behind in the background. After all, I was the youngest in the group, and it was only right that those who were older should go ahead of me. To be honest, I wanted to postpone as long as I could the disappointment if the man to whom I had owed so very much didn't remember me. Instead of disappointment, I felt elated, warmed by his smile and his words. I know who you are, he said with a glint in his eye. You're little Layson. I should have known that Oscar Schindler would never disappoint me. All right, I'm just going to stop right here because I'm getting distracted by the kids who are making comments on the side. I appreciate Grayson telling them to stop spamming and Owen, thank you for that. I appreciate it. So I will, I'm going to continue, um, but I will have to block people if it gets to be distracting and I can't focus on what I'm supposed to be reading. Um, so right now, if you haven't been paying attention, Leon Lason is in line. He's an adult. He's 35 and he's in California and um, he is meeting Oscar Schindler after not seeing him for well over probably 15 years plus. You guys are the math people. Hi, Jake. Um, so he's meeting this guy who saved his life many times. So he was worried that he didn't remember, he wouldn't remember him, but of course, um, that he did. Hi mom. My mom's now on. I see her chat. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I should have known that Oscar Schindler would never disappoint me on that day of our reunion. The world still didn't still didn't know of Oscar Schindler, nor of his heroism during the Second World War. But those of us at the airport knew all of us and over a thousand others owed our lives to him. We survived the Holocaust because of the enormous risk Schindler took and the bribes and the backroom deals he brokered to keep us, his Jewish workers, safe from the gas chambers of Auschwitz. He used his mind, his heart, his incredible street smarts, and his fortune to save our lives. He outwitted the Nazis by claiming we were essential to the war effort. Hey, that word has been used a lot lately, essential. People that are essential right now. So, but Oscar Schindler was claiming that his Jewish workers were very essential to the war effort to make sure that they win the war. So that's how they were able to keep working in his factory and not go to the gas chambers. Um, um even though he knew that many of us, myself included, had no useful skills at all. In fact, only by standing on a wooden box could I reach the controls of the machine I was assigned to operate. That box gave me a chance to look useful, to stay alive. I, was, I am an unlikely survivor of the Holocaust. I had so much going against me and almost nothing going for me. I was just a boy. I had no connections. I had no skills but I had one factor in my favor that trumped everything else. Oscar Schindler thought my life had value. And if you see, I have that one line highlighted and it's so important to me um, that that is how I teach because I want you guys to know that your life has value, that you are important and that somebody cares about you. And that is how, um, that's how he felt with Oscar Schindler, that of everybody in the world, that this guy cared about him and thought his life had value. He thought I was worth saving. Even when giving me a chance to live, he put his, put his own life in peril. Now it's my turn to do what I can for him to tell about the Oscar Schindler I knew. 
My hope is that he will become a part of your memory, even as I was always a part of his. This is also the story of my life and how it intersected with his. Along the way, I will introduce my family. They also endangered their lives to save mine. Even in the worst of times, they made me feel I was loved and that my life mattered. In my eyes, they are heroes too. So that was the, um, sorry, I'm going to the beginning of the book that I want to tell you about. Um, so um, that was the prologue. And it's kind of important that you get that information um, before the book starts. So he's telling, the prologue is him at 35, telling you a little bit about Oscar Schindler, a little bit about his experience and introducing the book to you, telling you that, you know, because Oscar Schindler thought that his life had value, even as a kid, and because his parents and his family thought his life had value, that is how he went through and survived conditions we will never, I hope, ever have to endure or imagine. Um, so I think that's really important for you guys to take away that when you know that your life matters and is valued, that you pretty much can get through anything, really anything. I mean, I know some of you have been through a lot already. I know I've been through a lot already. So knowing that your life has value to other people is very, 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 very important. So are you ready? This next part is funny and I'm sure it's going to get your attention. It's a great way to start the book, especially for younger people. Are you ready? Chapter one, I ran barefoot across the meadow toward the river. Now remember, he's a kid now again, okay? So I ran barefoot across the meadow toward the river. Once among the trees, I flung off my clothes, grabbed my favorite low-hanging branch and swung out across the river and let go. A perfect landing. Floating, I'm waiting for comments. Don't even comment. I know what you're all are thinking, but how funny is that? So here he's a kid. What the, what the author is trying to paint for you in the next little bit of this first chapter is how carefree their life was, um, how they went through life without any worries. He was just a kid having fun. Um, and, and back in the day, I don't know. That's what they did. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> so let's focus on the fact that not, actually what he was doing, but just the fact that the, what he's trying to show you is that before all of this starts, he was just a kid, just having fun, hanging out with his friends. Anyway, floating along in the water, I heard one splash and then another as two of my friends joined me. Soon we climbed out of the river and raced back to our favorite branches to start all over again. When lumberjacks working upstream threatened to spoil our fun by sending their freshly cut trees downstream to the mill, we adapted quickly, opting to lay on our backs, each as a separate log, gazing at the sunlight breaking through the canopy of the oak, spruce, and pines. Now, sorry, no matter how many times we repeated these routines, I never tired of them. Sometimes on those hot summer days, we wore swim trunks, at least if we thought any adults might be around. Mostly, we wore nothing. I know. See, I have your undivided attention right now. You're like, what? The Simmons reading this to us? <gasps> I love it. <laughs> anyway, okay, back to what I was reading. What made the escapades even more exciting was that my mother had forbidden my going to the river. Hmm. Sound familiar, people? Okay. After all, I didn't know how to swim. Okay. At this point, I'm thinking, seriously, guy, you don't know how to swim and you're going to the river even after your mom told you not to. Remember what happened to Max and Freak the Mighty when Grim and Graham told him not to go over to the tenements and he went anyway? Mm-hmm. See? Telling you. Listen to your parents or your guardians or your grandparents. We know what's happening. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> probably because we tried it one time in our lives ourselves and we know what's going to happen. All right. So in winter, the river was just as much fun. My older brother, Sally, helped me create ice skates from all kinds of unlikely materials. Metal remnants retrieved from our, Oh, <laughs> my son's coming up the stairs and apparently he, <laughs> he tripped. Yeah. I'm, I'm live streaming. So you know, good, don't worry. 
That's him. That's my son. <laughs> That's Adam. Okay. <laughs> so sorry about that. We'll have distractions, I'm sure, along the way. <clears throat> In winter, the river was just as much fun. My older brother, Salig, helped me create ice skates from all kinds of unlikely materials, metal remnants retrieved from our grandfather, the blacksmith, and bits of wood from fire, the firewood pile. We were inventive in crafting our skates. They were primitive and clumsy, but they worked. I was small yet fast. I loved racing with the bigger boys across the bumpy ice. One time, David, another of my brothers, skated on thin ice that gave way. He fell into the freezing river. Oh my gosh, seriously? Luckily, it was shallow water. I helped him out and we hurried home to change our dripping clothes and thaw out by the hearth. Once we were warm and dry, back we raced to the river for another adventure. Life seemed an endless carefree journey. So not even the scariest of fairy tales. This is a part. So it's like, yay, carefree. Now listen to this next part. Oh, hi, Adam again. <laughs> Grandma Carper is watching this too. I don't know, because it's Grandma. She likes to see what I'm doing. Okay. Anyway, she wants to hear a story, I'm guessing. The boy on the wooden box. Want to listen? I'm going to read Morris Goes to School. Okay. You read Morris Goes to School. You can come over here and sit and listen, just like back in the old days. All right. I got to keep reading. They want to know what's going to happen. Okay. Oh, boy. Someone went waist deep in the middle of a one. Oh, boy. And then, no kidding, Lucas. Wouldn't that be nice if we were carefree like that? Everything is so crazy now, and we're, we're racing to go everywhere. It would be nice to have fun just like that. Um, and Owen... Adam went downstairs, but I'll tell him you said hi later. Um, okay, so back to this. So this last sentence was, um, life seemed an endless carefree journey. So not even the scariest of fairy tales could have prepared me for the monsters I would confront just a few years later. The narrow escapes I would experience or the hero disguised as a monster himself who would save my life. My first years gave no warning of what was to come. My given name is Labe Laysen, although now I am known as Leon Laysen. I was born in Narefka, a rural village in northeastern Poland, near Bialystok, not far from the border of Belarus. My ancestors had lived there for generations, in fact, more than 200 years. Oh yeah, by the way, I will probably mispronounce names of places. I will try my best. I even wrote like little notes to myself on some of them, but... Um, I am not an expert at those names. Hi, Adam again. Elwin said hi, by the way. Hi. Adam said hi, everybody. Um, so anyway, so I just want to put that disclaimer out there that um, I won't pronounce things correctly. My, um, my parents were honest, hardworking people who never expected anything they did not earn. My mother, Hannah, was the youngest of five children, two daughters, and three sons. Her older sister was called Shana, which in Yiddish means beautiful. My aunt was indeed beautiful. My mother wasn't. That's so bad. Oh, my gosh. Okay, can we stop talking about the, the virus over here on the side? You're totally, like, distracting me, what I'm reading. We're all over that. Okay. Um, so wait, so did you hear what he said about his mom? But it gets better though, I promise. So his mom's sister, so his aunt was named Shana, which in Yiddish in their language means beautiful. My aunt was indeed beautiful. My mom wasn't. And that fact informed the way everyone treated them, including their own parents. Their parents certainly loved both their daughters, but Shana was regarded as too beautiful to do physical labor, while my mother was not. I remember my mother telling me about having to haul buckets of water to the workers in the fields. It was hot, the water was heavy, but the task turned out to be fortuitous to her and for me. It was in these fields my mother first caught the eye of her future husband. So two things are going to be lucky for her, fortuitous for her, that's a big word. One, if she wasn't doing the work, 
that manual work that her sister didn't have to do. She wouldn't have met her husband. So Leon Lason wouldn't be here. But the other part is think about it in the, um, what happens to Jewish people later. They have to be prepared and they have to be hard workers and know how to do hard work. So I think by her being able to being having or having to work in the with her parents and do all that labor that she probably learned how to be a hard worker. And that probably I'm going to guess in a sense will be um, saving her life as well. Well, as far as we know, we'll see what happens. Even though my father initiated their courtship, their marriage had to be arranged by their parents or at least seemed to be. That was the accepted custom in Eastern, Euro Eastern Europe at the time. Fortunately, both sets of parents were pleased with their children's mutual attraction. Soon, the couple married. My mother was 16 and my father, Moishe, was 18. Yes, I know. No comments about that either because we talked about different cultures and what's acceptable. And back in the day in Eastern Europe, that is the age that people got married. So you don't have to comment about it because we talked about how, you know, accepting how different cultures work. That is the one way that their culture, um, what was acceptable back in the day. For Remember, there wasn't school, there wasn't college, women didn't have careers, so all of that kind of stuff. So that's one of the reasons. Um, for my mother, married life was in many ways similar to how her life had been with her parents. Her days were spent doing housework, cooking and caring for her family. But instead of her parents and siblings, she now looked after her husband and soon their children. As the youngest of five children, I didn't have my mother to, to myself very often. So one of my favorite times is when my brothers and sisters were at school and our women neighbors came to visit. They would sit around the hearth knitting or making pillows for goose from goose feathers. I watched as the women gathered the feathers and stuffed them into the pillowcases just so gently shaking them so they spread out evenly. Inevitably, some of the down would escape. My job was to retrieve the little feathers that wafted through the air like snowflakes. I reached for them, but they would float away. Now and then I'd get lucky and catch a handful, and the women would reward my efforts with laughter and applause. Plucking geese was hard work, so every single feather was precious. Again, a whole different time period where everything that you had was used and everything was very valuable. So even the smallest of feathers, if they got away, they were very valuable because it was hard work. And we really honestly don't know. I don't think most of us know the hard work, what it was like to be back there in those days. I looked forward to listening to my mother swap stories and sometimes a bit of local village gossip with her friends. I saw a different, more peaceful and relaxed side of her then. Busy as my mother was, she always had time to show me her love. She sang with us children, and of course she made sure we did our homework. <laughs> Once I was sitting by myself at the table, studying arithmetic, that's math, when I heard a rustling behind me. I had been so focused on what I was learning that I hadn't heard my mother come in and begin cooking. It wasn't mealtime, so that was surprising. Then she handed me a plate of scrambled eggs made just for me. She said, you're such a good boy. You deserve a special treat. I still feel pr the pride that welled up within me at that moment. I had made my mother proud. That's pretty awesome. So remember we talked about in Long Walk to Water when he had a, he couldn't wait to go home to have milk for his snack. And we were like, what? And some of you went home and had milk for your snack. Um, same here. So having some scrambled eggs was a real treat and something they probably just didn't get any time they wanted. So it was really a treat for him. I could eat some scrambled eggs right now. Oh, I gotta have to wait till I'm done reading. Okay. My father had always been determined to provide a good life for us. He saw a better future in factory work than in his family's trade of blacksmithing. Shortly after marrying, he began working as an apprentice machinist in a small factory that produced hand-blown glass bottles of all sizes. There, my father learned how to make the molds for the bottles. Thanks to his hard work, his innate ability, and his sheer determination, he was frequently promoted. One time, the factory owner selected my father to attend an advanced course in tool design in the nearby city of Bialstock. 
I knew that it was an important opportunity because he bought a new jacket, especially for the occasion. Buying new clothes was something that didn't happen very often in our family. The glass factory prospered and the owner decided to expand the business by moving it to Krakow, a thriving city about 350 miles southwest of Narefka. This caused a great deal of excitement in our village. In those days, it was rare for young people, really for anyone, to leave the town of their birth. My father was one of the few employees to move in when, uh, sorry, to move with the factory. The plan was for my father to go first. When he had enough money, he would bring all of us to Krakow. It took him several years to save much, to save that much, and to find a suitable place for us to live. In the meantime, my father returned every six months or so to see us. I was too young to recall exactly when my father left Narefka that first time, but I do remember when he came back to spend a few days. When he arrived, the entire village knew. My father was a, was a tall, handsome man who always took great pride in his appearance. He liked the more formal attire of men in Krakow and gradually purchased several elegant suits. Whenever he came for a visit, he wore a beautiful suit, dress shirt, and necktie. That caused quite a sensation among the villagers who were accustomed to loose-fitting, simple peasant clothing. Little did I know, those very suits would help to save our lives during the terrible years ahead. So here's my question to those of you that are listening. Again, this part, remember, this part is just giving you background information. So you learn a little bit about his family um, what they're like, what his background was before you get into really like the heart of the story, what really is going to be happening. So remember to stick in there with me because this is the harder part. Um, so my question is this, I want to hear some predictions. If you can type it in the comment section, he said that, um, little did I know those very suits would help to save our lives during the terrible years ahead. My question is, how do you think suits, like his dad's business suits, could help them later when they were going through all these terrible things? What do you guys think? I'm going to wait, maybe see if you guys can type something in there. Um, what do you think, how could suits save their lives later or help them to get through all the terrible times that they're going to get through? So I'll wait a minute. I'm going to have a sip of my coffee if that's okay with everybody. Mm. Lucas said he can sell them. So maybe they can get money from them. Any other ideas? It's a good guess to get money. Yep. I can, I got that. Good job, Lucas. Um, we'll see. Um, anybody else? Yep. So Owen said to sell them to, oh, good one. So people think he is extra important. Oh, could be. Oh, my mom even could sell them for a high price. Oh, Evan said they needed the suits to look formal enough to prove they had worth in the factory. Ooh, I love your thinking. Good job. Good work. Well, you're going to have to kind of stick in with me. It's stick with me with the book to find out how they actually, you know, um, help to save their lives because it, it will be coming up later. Um, Grayson said because they look more formal. Okay, we'll see what happens, Okay. Um, it's not too much later in the book that we'll find that out, I believe. Um, okay, here we go. So again, this part is going to explain a little bit about his his family, um, his dad, his brothers and sisters are coming up. Okay, so kind of keep track of his brothers and sisters too. It's kind of hard because he has a few of them. Um, okay, my father's visits always felt like a holiday. Oh, maybe they would help to disguise him as a German. Ooh, look at my mom getting in on the action. Maybe mom... You're just going to have to wait and see what happens. This is a really good book. You're going to love it. Um, okay. My father's visits always felt like a holiday. Everything was different when he was home. Most, most days, given all that mother had to do to look out after my four siblings and me, meals were pretty informal. Oh, wait. Let me see. Griffin said something. I do believe that they could sell the suits on a side market as not to show attention to the Nazis and would buy food. Good guess. Let's see. I don't know. I mean, I do know, but I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. Um, I love it. Thanks for putting all your input in, guys. Um, all right. Where was I? Oh, yeah. So um, most days, given all that my that his mom had to do, 
um, to look after four siblings, meals were pretty informal. Sometimes that looks like that at my house. Like when we're super busy, like our meals aren't super, like everybody sits down at the table because we're all running around. I don't know. It's probably like that in your house sometimes. So meals are kind of informal. Sometimes it's like, okay, just grab the leftovers and, and eat when you can. Um, maybe you guys are like that, but it sounds like when is his, yeah, I know Lucas, right? So um, sometimes when, so when his dad was away, his poor mom had all these kids to take care of. And um, I'm sure it was so hard because I think it's hard now. And I've got all these like easy things to help me take care of the kids. And, and so I'm sure it was really hard for her back then. Um, so, all right. So let's see. So this changed when my father was there. Um, we sat around the um, we sat around the table with the serving dishes spread out before us. There was always a few more eggs at breakfast and a little more meat at dinner. We listened to his stories of life in the city, enthralled by his tales of the modern conveniences like indoor plumbing and streetcars, things we could scarcely imagine. Here we go again, guys. Okay, so indoor plumbing. So they must have had outhouses back in the day where he lived out in the country. So again, poor mom. Can you imagine all these like conveniences that we have nowadays? She didn't really have. Now, it probably wasn't as bad as long walk to water where they absolutely had zero. Um, but seems like their conveniences were not what we have today or even in the cities back then. Um, we four brothers, Herschel, Salad, Salig, David, and I were on our best behavior. So four boys. Oh my, 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 this poor lady, four boys. Oh boy. Okay. Um, <laughs> They were on their his, their best behavior when his dad was there because they vied for their father for our father's attention. But we knew our sister Pesha was really his favorite since she was the only girl in our family of rumb rambunctious boys. That probably wasn't surprising. Whenever we siblings got into a minor altercation, I can remember it was never Pesha's fault, even though it might have been. When we teased her too much, father intervened and reprimanded us. Pesha had long blonde hair that my mother plaited into thick braids. She helped my mother around the house and was quiet and obedient. I can understand why my father favored her. <laughs> now, even though it probably seemed to him like his father favored his daughter, probably because she was his only daughter, I am sure that he loved them all the same because that's how it is as a parent. Often, father brought us presents from the big city. <laughs> Lucas, I know you could so talk to my brother right now. He'd say the same thing um, that the girls never got really into trouble, that we never got into trouble. It's always the boy's fault, the brother's fault. That's funny. Well, it was. <clears throat> okay, so mostly it was my brother's fault. It could have been my fault some of the time. Just saying. All right, there, I admitted it. Okay. Um, so often father brought us presents from the big city. The candy boxes he brought had photos. Oh, this is interesting. Hold on. Let me reread that. The candy boxes he brought had photos on some of the grand of the grand historic buildings and tree lined boulevards of Krakow. I was like, wait, candy, what? So on the cover of them, they had pictures of what the city looked like. Interesting. I used to stare at them for a long time, trying to imagine what it would be like to actually live in such a glamorous place. As the youngest child, I always got the hand-me-downs, shirts, shoes, pants, and toys. On one visit, my father brought us gifts of child-sized briefcases. I saw my brothers with theirs and thought that once again, I would have to wait until one of them passed his on to me. I really didn't think that was fair. This time, I was in for a surprise. Packed into one of the briefcases was even a smaller one just right for me. I was so happy. Though his visits were only for a few days, my father always made a special time for me. Nothing gave me more joy than walking with him to his parents' house with his friends greeting him along the way. He always held my hand in his, playing with my fingers. It was like a secret signal between us of how much he loved me, his youngest child. My brother Herschel was the oldest. Then came my brother, oh boy, I can never pronounce his name, correctly. Then came my brother, but Salad. I don't even know if I, I can't, I just totally butchered it, but they called him Salig. 
which is weird if you can see how they spell his name. Where is it? Oh, it's all backwards too. Oh, well. Anyway, they spell his name T-S-A-L-I-G. Um, and they his name is Salig, so they don't pronounce the T in it. Anyway, so his older brother Herschel, we have heard that name, I'm sure, before. And then his brother Salig was next. It was his sister Pesha, and then his brother David, and then me. So five of them. And Leon was the youngest. I thought of Herschel as the biblical Samson. He was big, strong, and feisty. My parents used to say he was a handful. As a teenager, he rebelled and refused to go to school. He wanted to be doing something more useful. By that time, my father was working in Krakow, so my parents made the decision that Herschel should join my father there. I had mixed feelings about this. I was sorry to see my big brother leave, but it was a relief also. He had been a worry for my mother, and young as I was, I knew it was better for Herschel to be with my father. Herschel preferred city life and rarely came with my father when he had visited us. So that is kind of like sad that his older oldest brother went to go live with his dad in the city um, to do work. Um, but it probably was a little bit of a relief because it sounded like he was a little bit of a troublemaker and probably hard for his mom to handle. So, all right. I know, right? And then when his dad came home to visit, Herschel hardly ever came home to visit either. So that's kind of sad too. Um so where was I? Oh, if Herschel was tough and headstrong, my brother Salig was in many ways his opposite. It usually works that way in families. Siblings sometimes tend to be opposite of each other. Salig was gentle and kind. Though he was six years older and had every reason to act vastly superior to me, his kid brother, he never did. In fact, I don't remember him once treating me like the nuisance I probably was. He even let me tag along with him on his excursions about town. A technical wizard, Salig was a superhero to me. There seemed to be nothing he couldn't do. He once built a radio using crystals instead of electricity to pick up broadcasts from Warsaw and Biostock and even Krakow. He made the entire apparatus, including the box that housed the equipment. And he figured out how to rig up a long wire antenna to get a signal. That's pretty impressive. I mean, I can't imagine like doing, I don't, my brain doesn't work that way, but I bet some of you could probably do it. Um, it seemed like magic to me when I put on the headphone Salig handed me and heard the famous trumpeter of Krakow marking the noon hour with his horn hundreds of miles away. It was my brother, David, a little over a year older than me, who was my closest companion I remember David telling me that when I was a baby, he would rock the cradle if I was crying. We oft, we were often together. Still teasing me seemed to be among his favorite pastimes. He had a gleeful smirk whenever I fell for one of his pranks. Sometimes I felt so frustrated with his tricks, tears filled my eyes. Once, when he and I were eating noodles, he told me the noodles really were worms. He kept at it so long and remained so serious he finally convinced me. I gagged and David howled with laughter. It wasn't long before we were best friends again until David found another opportunity to pester me. I bet some of you had that relationship with people at your house too. Yeah. So even though he's super, super close with David, you know, his brother picked on him quite a bit and played pranks on him. There were about a thousand Jews in Narefka. I looked forward to going to synagogue services with my maternal grandparents with whom I was especially close. I loved hearing the prayers resonate throughout the building. The rabbi would begin the service in a strong, vibrant voice that soon blended in with the voices of the congregation. Every few minutes, his voice would rise again as he called out a line or two, indicating where everyone should be in the prayer book. The rest of the time, each member of the congregation was on his own, on his or her own. It felt as if we were one, but also that each of us had a personal communion with God. I guess to an outsider, it might have seemed strange, but to us, it felt utterly right. Sometimes when a Christian Pole, that's a person from Poland, wanted to describe a chaotic event, he would say, it was like a Jewish congregation. In those peaceful times, such a comment wasn't meant in a hostile way, but as an affirmation of how strange we seemed to those 
whose religious practices differed from ours. For the most part, Christians and Jews lived side by side in harmony in Nerefka, although I learned early on that I was pushing my luck by walking down the streets in my usual carefree way during Holy Week, the week before Easter. Huh. Coming up in a, in a few weeks. That was the one time our Christian neighbors treated us differently, as if we Jews suddenly were their enemies. Even some of my playmates became my assailants. They pelted me with stones and called me names that were cruel and hurtful, names like Christ killer. They didn't make much sense to me since I knew Jesus had lived centuries before, but my personal identi identity didn't count for much compared to my identity as a Jew. And for those who seemed to hate us, it didn't matter when a Jew lived. A Jew was a Jew. And every Jew was accountable for the death of Jesus. Fortunately, the animosity lasted only a few days out of the year. And generally in Nerefka, Jews and Gentiles existed peacefully alongside each other. Of course, there were always exceptions. The woman who lived across the street from us threw rocks at my Jewish pals and me just for walking on the sidewalk in front of her house. I guess she thought the very proximity of a Jew brought bad luck. I learned to cross to the other side of the street when I approached her house. Other neighbors were much nicer. The family who lived next door invited us over each year to see their decorated Christmas tree. So again, this part here kind of getting a little bit like, oh, what's, you know, I don't know if you're paying attention or not, but it's giving you information, a little bit of background information about the Jewish people and how they were treated um, on a regular basis before um, the war started. Um, all in all, Nerefka in the 1930s was a pretty idyllic place to grow up. Hey, idyllic was one of our words in Warhorse. It described the summers that Joey and um, Topthorn um, lived with Emily and her grandpapa. So idyllic is in this one too. All right. Oh, cool. So you like the book, Owen? Awesome. Yay. Okay. So, um, so anyway, so he was saying in the 1930s, ideally where he lived, it was idyllic. It was like peaceful. It was kind of a nice place to live, like not many problems. Um, from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, the Jews of Narefka observed the Sabbath. That, that's like a holy day, a time where they took time out. I love the quietness that fell as shops and businesses closed, a welcome respite from the weekday routine. So respite is a break. After services in the synagogue, people would sit on their porches chatting and chewing pumpkin seeds. They would often ask me to sing when I strolled by since I, I knew a lot of tunes and was admired for my voice, a distinction I lost when I entered adolescence and my voice changed. <laughs> so he had a good voice till he went through, you know, till he got older and his voice changed. But okay, September, I'm sure he had a good voice once his voice changed. September through May, I went to public school school in the morning and to Hader is called, it's spelled H E D E R Hader. And I think I'm, I don't know, maybe I should probably look that up to see if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, so he went to Jewish school in the afternoon there. I was expected to learn Hebrew and study the Bible. I had an edge on my classmates since I had learned from my brothers, imitating them as they were doing their, their Jewish homework, even if I didn't understand what they were studying. My parents enrolled me in the Jewish school when I was five years old. Roman Catholicism was the dominant religion of Poland, and religion was very much a part of the public school I attended. When my Catholic classmates recited their prayers, we Jews were required to stand and be silent. That was easier said than done. We were often reprimanded for trying to sneak in a whisper or a playful nudge when we were supposed to be standing like statues. It was risky to misbehave even a little bit since our teacher was quite willing to tell our parents. Sometimes my mother knew I had gotten in tr into trouble even before I arrived home in the afternoon. <laughs> Sound familiar, some of you? Um, my mother never spanked me, but she had a way of letting me know when I displeased her. I didn't much like that feeling. So for the most part, I tried to be good. One time my cousin Yasel Ask his teacher if he could change his name to Yosef in honor of Yosef Pilsudski, a Polish national hero. The teacher told him that a Jew was not allowed to have a Polish first name. 
I couldn't figure out why my cousin would want to exchange his Yiddish name, which in English means Joseph, for the Polish version. But the teacher's rebuff didn't surprise me. That was just the way life was. I made my second home with our neighbor, Lanceman, the tailor. I was fascinated by how he could direct the thinnest, most even spray of water from his mouth onto the clothes he was pressing. I loved visiting him, his wife, and their four sons, all of whom were skilled tailors. They sang at their work and in the evening sat together making music, singing, and playing instruments. I was mystified when the youngest son, a Zionist, decided to leave his home for distant Palestine. Why would he go so far away from his family and give up working and playing music with them? Now I realize his decision saved his life. His mother, his father, and his brothers all died in the Holocaust. Makes me so sad. Nerefka lacked most of what we consider necessities today. Streets were made of cobblestones or were unpaved. Most buildings were constructed of wood and were only one story high. People walked or traveled on horseback or by horse and wagon. I still remember when the marvel of electricity reached us in 1935. Hey, just like long walk to water. I was six years old. Every household had to decide whether or not to opt for electrical power. After a lot of discussion, my parents made the daring decision to bring the new invention into our home. A lone wire led to a socket installed in the middle of our ceiling. It seemed incredible that instead of a kerosene lamp, we now had a single glass bulb overhead by which we could read at night. All we had to do was pull the cord to turn it on and off. Whenever I thought my parents weren't looking, I'd climb on a chair and pull the cord just to see the light appear and disappear as if by magic. Amazing. In spite of the wonder of electricity, in most other ways, life in Narefka remained as it had been for centuries. There was no indoor plumbing, and in the bitter winter, the trip to the outhouse was one I learned to delay as long as possible. Our home had one large room that served as a kitchen, dining room, and living room all in one, and one bedroom. Privacy in the way we think of it today was entirely foreign to us. There was one bed, and we all shared it, my brothers, my mother, brothers, sister, and I. We collected our water from a well in our yard, dropping a bucket until we heard a splash, then winding it up full of water. The challenge was not to lose too much of the water as we lugged the water from the well to the house. It took several trips a day to meet our needs. Huh, that's like long walk to water, except they didn't have to walk miles and miles and miles and miles for it. I know. Can you believe that, Owen? I guess because they had like so little back in the day, like we have so much, right? Like we have things that like, here's my living room. There's my kitchen. My There's Adam's bedroom right there and downstairs. Um, I can't imagine. But when I went to Guatemala um, a few years ago, um, they lived in what we would call probably a shack. And if they were lucky, there'd be one, like a mattress laying on the floor. And the floor was like a dirt floor. It wasn't even a finished floor. So it's just interesting how people even today um, may live like that. And then also um, back in the day, this is kind of what their life was like. It was hard. Like we just turn on our spigot and we have water. And here you, they had to go fetch their water, kind of like in Long Walk to Water as well. All right. So um, again, this is just giving you background knowledge so you can kind of understand what his life was like before all of this started. Um, so you can kind of make a comparison. Sorry, my computer's moving. My dog's sitting on my lap and moving the computer. Um, let's see. Those of us in the village um, who were Jewish spoke Yiddish at home, Polish in public, and Hebrew in religious school or at the synagogue. Wait, so that's three, like Jewish, they spoke Yiddish, Polish, and Hebrew. Wow. And it says, I also learned some German from my parents. It turned out that knowing German would prove more useful to us than we could have ever imagined. Another key sentence in this book. So their suits for some reason. And the fact that they learned and knew a little bit of German. Um, I'll show you my dog in a little bit. <laughs> She's sleeping beside me. Um, 
Because Polish law prohibited Jews from owning land, um, as had been the case for centuries for Jews in Europe, my maternal grandfather, Jacob Meyer, leased his farmland from the Eastern Orthodox Church. He endured long hours of physical labor to support his family. He tilled his fields, he dug potatoes out of the earth with a spade, and cut down hay with a scythe. I, I felt grand riding atop his horse-drawn wagon while it was piled high with bundles of hay at the end of the harvest. After my father left for Krakow, my, my mother increasingly relied on her parents for help. My grandfather frequently came by our house with potatoes and beets and other produce from his garden to make sure his daughter and his grandchildren didn't go hungry. Still, even with her parents' help, my mother had her hands full, since by and large, she was a single parent raising a house full of children. Just keeping us fed and in clean clothes and making sure we had the supplies we needed for school was a huge job. She never had any time completely for herself. In Narefka, everyone knew their neighbors and knew what they did for a living. Men frequently identified were identified by their occupation rather than by their last name. My paternal grandfather was known as Jacob, the blacksmith, and our neighbor was Lanceman, the tailor. A woman was of, often referred to by her husband's name as Jacob's wife, for example, while children were sometimes known according to who their parents or grandparents were. People didn't think of me first and foremost of being Leon Lason. They didn't even think of me as being the son of Moishe and Hannah, but rather they referred to me as Jacob Myers' grandson. That simple fact says a lot about the world in which I grew up in. It was a patriarchal society in which age was respected. Imagine that. Even revered, especially when, as in my maternal grandfather's case, age meant a lifetime of hard work and of caring for his family and devotion to his faith. I always stood a little bit taller and a little bit more special when people spoke of me as Jacob Myers' grandson. So that would be like, you wouldn't be known as Owen or Lucas or Maddie. You'd be known as, you know, whatever your grandfather's name was. And, or you might be known as like Mike Goodfellow's son. Could be like that. I could be known as Mervyn Keith's granddaughter or, you know, maybe my parents' name. All right, so here's the deal. So I've been going on for almost an hour. This is the longest chapter in the book. So we're going to stop right there um, for now, for today. I'll put a marker in my on my page, um, and I will read again um, tomorrow, even though I'm probably supposed to be not doing that as per what administration said. So um, look again tomorrow at one o'clock seems to be a good time for me. Um, and um, I will continue to read the book at that time. So I know, right? But I do have to go. I have to eat something. I'm kind of hungry. Oh, and you want to see my dog. Here she is. Ready? Say hi, Lucy. There's my dog, Lucy. There she is. Say hi. All right, calm down. You don't have to lick everything. Yeah, that's Lucy. Um, one o'clock tomorrow, Randall or uh, Randall. Oh my gosh, Evan is when I will be. Uh, I'll read again to you guys. So again, um, after tomorrow or during tomorrow, um, we'll get through this first chapter, and then um, life as he knows it will probably start to change. So uh, I will see you guys later. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Get outside a little bit if you can before it rains. Okay. What did Griffin say? I think it might be at least one day. Yeah. She said one day a week. Yeah. We're supposed to be communicating um, on Mondays from like eight to noon. So that's when I'll put out information into Seesaw, but I will be into Seesaw more than that. And um, checking to see if you guys are sending me things. I'm going to take a break for today. So if I go into Seesaw today, it will be later today. And um, I'll see if you guys wrote anything. Um, okay, guys. Um, so I am going to just kind of keep reading this book. And if you guys want to tune in, great. If not, it's in my it's on my YouTube channel. So you can choose to 
watch it anytime you want. So you don't have to be watching it live. Um, so, all right, guys, I love you. I hope you have a good rest of your day and I'll read to you guys tomorrow. Love you.